Hey guys, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming, and some of you know me on Twitter, The Gaming Dragon. Today I'm coming at you another Let's Play episode of No More Future. Well, I should say tonight, because I'm recording this at night, in my room with my, with my laptop. So, let's see, the last place we left off, we were in the restaurant with, uh, with Jasper, and he was lecturing us, and... But we're trying to find some common ground with a guy. We actually made him smile in the last episode, which was, like, incredible. Someone should have, like, framed, like framed it and put it on a damn wall. But anyway, guys, let's just sit back and enjoy. Let me entertain you for the next 20 minutes, and let's jump right in. Oh, yeah, and I'm almost done with my script for my interview with Sedge. Um, if you guys can give me any tips on any kind of dynamic backgrounds that I can use uh, while, while we're doing a little interview, that would, that would help. That would help greatly. I'm just, I'm still just, I'm still just trying to figure out what to put in the background while he and I are talking. You know, I, w I want something to be happening. You know. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's go ahead and jump right in. All right, alarm ten, you're up, and let's go. Okay. <clears throat> and of course, I don't need to explain things like smartphones or the internet even existing, do I? That's like way too many things at once. Is this yet another of your we do everything non arguments? Oh please. Those were only three examples. I can make a thousand more. My point is, most people enjoy when things are easy, approachable, comfortable. And our job is to provide all these things and so much more. We give our customers all, all over the world exactly what they want, when and where they want it, and we don't give them reasons to stress about the details. That's why we became as influential as we did. That's why nobody minds that in the slightest. Oh, so they're Amazon. So he says, and yet you find yourself minding an awful lot. Everything that comes out of his lips sounds like pure madness, and yet he speaks with the same tone of a teacher going through an average lesson at school. It's rather freaky, actually. And nonetheless, the more this goes on, the more things start to make sense. If Pandora truly does own everything, it would explain how Mary and Jasper could wreak havoc on your apartment complex the other day as nonchalantly as they did. Celine Inc. is nothing more but another front for their activities. Of course, being as rich and powerful as he claims would easily allow them to rack up the funding for the Synthetic Project now, and the Kronos Project way back when. Even the FBI's interest in their affairs becomes a lot more understandable with all this new information. You're not sure whether to feel intrigued or repelled by the Drake's words as of this moment, but with all the evidence that surrounds you, you'd be hard-pressed not, not to believe them nonetheless. I guess it's just kind of hard to wrap my head around everything you've said. It's not every day that you find out, well, all this. Indeed. Frankly, I thought you'd have far less trouble internalizing all this than you actually did. Then again, I did also wrongly assume you'd already been made aware of most of it. Nonetheless, you can rest assured that Pandora is every bit as influential as I claimed it is. We even used to be the world government up until not that long ago. Y you were? That's not all that hard to believe, considering everything you've heard so far. Don't act so surprised. I'm sure you've already wondered how come we were allowed to reach this level of influence to begin with by now. Well, that is true. I was meaning to inquire about that at some point. After all, shouldn't there be, like, antitrust laws to protect against this kind of power consolidation? Even if there weren't, you're pretty sure no government would have even allowed them to become more powerful than them to begin with. Assuming Jasper doesn't tell you that governments never existed or some other dystopian nonsense along those lines. There were many such laws in the past, that is true. However, like all laws, they mattered only to the extent that they were enforced. And we gave the authorities plenty of reasons not to enforce them. You mean they were on your payroll? Correct. The people voted politicians into office to do their interests, and we paid them to do ours instead. To a certain extent, we still do. Don't get me wrong. There were some attempts at getting us out of the picture. In 2077, some congressmen brought forth a bill that included a strict $1 trillion roof on the share capital of every holding operating in the country. It would have effectively killed our business in the country, seeing as though our shares at the time were about 300 times that. 300 times? You really ought to stop sounding so surprised when you say stuff like that. I assume you're going to say that the draft, never, the draft was never made into law? That it didn't. It failed to make it past the Senate, where 56% of the members voted against it. You had that many people on your side? That's crazy! Of course not. That would have been, unim that would, that would have been unmanageable, even by our standards. We had 97% of the Senate on our side, and not the same number of people in the House as well. Pandora never leaves anything up to chance, which has made that fact a little less obvious this way. Well, so much for the democratic process still being anything like what you were taught in school. This is beginning to sound more and more like one of those dystopian books you studied in English class by the minute. 
Give me a break! Next you'll tell me you're on the media, too! Edric raises an eyebrow at your exclamation, wondering if you're serious about that. Isaac, don't piss off the Pandora Corporation. They own literally everything! My god, their umbrella. <laughs> Oh, for the love of... Did Dr. Shelley never teach you to think before saying such foolishness out loud? First off, rude. And secondly, why wouldn't I jump to the conclusion that... No, wait a minute. Now that I think about it, it doesn't add up. If Pandora owns all the media, there's no way people would have just such a jagged outlook on me even existing. There'd be positive coverage of Pandora and their synthetics up the wazoo. And yet, that's hardly the case. Half the world is still against you for reasons you can only half understand. It doesn't sound like something they'd, al they'd allow, given all the power they supposedly possess, if they could avoid it. Alright, fair. I, I guess it wouldn't make sense if you were the ones to manage the news. I suppose this means someone else does. Ah, and here I thought I'd need to explain this to you as well. Lucky me. But yes, it is as you said. We may be in charge of more things than I can count, but the news is one of the few we don't. As annoying as it is to admit, Mr. Algen and Miss Lightning aren't the only hand aren't the only hard headed people in the world. Another company, way back when, Prometheus, also refused to work with us in any capacity. They say we were do they say what we were doing. They saw what we were doing and decided they wanted a taste of the pie as well. They began amassing power in the media sector, pulling together news stations, internet companies, social networks all under their banner. So they became you, only a lot smaller. An interesting way to put it, but yes, it is as you say. Their duties consist similar, summarily in keeping their customers alert as to what is going on all over the world, as well as to provide them the means to react, discuss, even influence these events sometimes. To that end, they curate the experience of all their customers in order to ensure maximum engagement, in order to give everybody exactly what they want. I'm not sure I follow. What does that have to do with the way people still look at me? Why does everyone, why is everyone, everyone still convinced that I'm going to turn out to be the next Kronos? Jasper's eyes rolled to the ceiling at your comment, evidently unamused. Well, you being the best candidate for the role certainly doesn't help. Yeah, right, and the objective answer is... A little snarky coming from you, but the Drake's practically asking for it at this point. The least he could do after bombarding you with all this unwanted information is to answer your question, especially considering it's not even that far from the current... not far off from the current topic either. You honestly don't get it. The role isn't just to report the truth, it's to sell it to different people, all of which are looking for a unique spin on it. Regarding synthetic technology, for example, they sell pro-synthetic media to those who are pro-synthetic and peddle the rest to those who aren't. They don't force anyone to watch it, mind you, much like how they don't force anyone to watch the news to begin with. But the much the same as they do with us, their customers simply don't care. They naturally gravitate towards content they agree with and shy away from everything else. That's why so many people are convinced you'll turn into the same as you'll be turned up the same as Kronos, because they never needed any convincing in the first place, only reinforcing. That's messed up! How am I supposed to change these people's minds in these conditions? See, that's the interesting part. You can't, and you won't. Whether the media's machine, whether the media machines ever... Ooh, one second. I'm starting, I'm starting to talk faster than I can keep up. Ooh. Ah, clogging my airways. Whether the, media, whether the media's machine ever starts spinning in your favor relies entirely on whether they can profit from it or not. It has nothing to do with anything either you or us can or will do. Well, that's just great. And you honestly can't do anything about it? Hardly. Like I said, Prometheus is its own company, and they need our infrastructure to operate as much as we need them to not go overboard with their reporting. This means that they won't go to war with us by deliberately sicking the populace against us, but it also means we can't force them to spread alternative facts one way or another. You mean propaganda. Isn't that what you're asking me for? Isn't that what you're asking me for? Drake's words, Drake's words sting you more than you thought they would. You truly hadn't realized just what you were asking for until he stated it out loud. Of course, you never wanted to use propaganda to convince everyone that you're still alive. No sane person ever would. But the fact that this conversation led you to believe that might even be possible, even if it isn't, is extremely concerning. Dear Diary, today I learned the whole world is owned by two massive mega-corporations. Sounds like a great opener, don't you think? Jasper, Jasper scoffs at your comma as your joke, evidently unamused with your cynicism. I don't see why you'd sound so glum when saying that. It's truly nowhere near as bad as you think it is. Nowhere near as- are you kidding me? You just confess that the free market is a myth, that our government is a farce, that me and everybody else out there has been living a lie their entire life. Do you have any idea how messed up everything you just said truly sounds? I do. 
And the dragon's response is so curt and to the point, it's almost like a sucker punch to the gut. The way I see it is, the world's working just as intended. Nobody's unemployed against their will. Nobody's waging wars over resources and other petty reasons. Nobody has any reason to go out into the streets and protest. Everybody's perfectly content with the way things are. So content, in fact, that they don't even bother trying to learn more about the, how, this be, how all this became possible to begin with. Not even you. The dragon's ruthless comments force you to retreat into yourself once again, much like Bradbury's, much, much like Bradbury's did just yesterday. It almost feels like being accused of committing a heinous crime. A crime you didn't even know you had committed until just now. And judging by the regret you're feeling, you're probably guilty of it too. You can make as many comments on the system as you wish. The fact of the matter is that it works. That's all I'm concerned with. You provide food for the starving, electricity for the needy, medical care for the ill, and so much more. Thanks to us, nobody in the world is ever faced with a problem they cannot solve. A need they cannot fulfill. And though we ask for compensation for our services in both labor and currency, our prices are fair and our quality excellent. Nobody's ever complained, nobody's ever noticed, because there are no faults to complain about and no problems to notice. This is what we do. This is what people want. Deal with it. Silence. The sound of the wind outside the windows is all you can hear. That and your own thoughts, plaguing your mind like a disease spurred on by the dragon's words. But soon enough, yet another voice adds itself to the endless chorus. Oh, you know, he has a point. The familiar voice comes from a nearby table, one you haven't looked at in quite a while. It's low and serious, and it crawls up your spine much the same as a serpent slithers amidst the grass. Ha! <laughs> oh, Bradbury, you old dog. When you turn to look in its direction, you find a smirking St. Bernard calmly sitting at the table like a normal customer waiting to be served, even though it's completely barren. His gaze is transfixed upon the two of you, almost as if delighting in the surprise and confusion that his sudden arrival has caused. What are you doing here? And when did he even get here, for that matter? You definitely didn't hear him walk in, that's for sure. How long has he been observing the two of you for, exactly? Now, now... That's not how one's meant to greet others when in public, Isaac. It's impolite. Isn't that right, Mr. Morgan? The canine shifts his gaze to the drake sitting opposite you, as if gauging his reaction. Though Jasper's clearly annoyed at your blunt reaction as well, the main brunt of his aggression appears to be directed exclusively towards the unexpected guest. Guest, much to your relief. The android has a point, Bradbury. Your presence here is rather unexpected. So tell us what you're doing here before my mood begins to sour. Bradbury dodges Jasper's cold stare and threatening words with the finesse of a cheetah. Ah, my apologies. I had no idea you weren't having a great time. From over here, I had honestly thought you were hitting it off quite nicely. But to answer your question, I just so happened to stumble upon this restaurant while my late morning jog and decided to stop here for lunch. Completely out of whim, of course. Bullshit, you immediately think, unamused with the canine's futile attempt at deception. Judging from the look on Jasper's eyes, he's having very similar thoughts himself. Right. So you just happened to stumble onto me and the android, on the one occasion we decided to have lunch together. That is the gist of what I'm saying, yes. And you came to the one restaurant that's supposed to be closed to the general public right now. The canine lifts an, the canine lifts an eyebrow tiredly, and you're unsure whether that's because he doesn't have an answer or because he thinks the question is pointless in the first place. How did you even get here? I took the elevator, same as you did. You didn't think I'd take the stairs, did you? No offense, but we are more than 20 stories up, and my physique isn't quite the same as what it once was. You don't have time to even question the veracity of Bradbury's explanation as the same skunk familiar in the afternoon comes back to your table, a frantic expression on his face. Oh, sincerest apologies, sir. We had no idea this man managed to sneak inside. The man looks at the CEO like a criminal fearing for his life. As if he didn't look so uncomfortable, you'd almost find it pathetic. Fortunately, though, the dragon appears quite upset at this unexpected development you're outing. He stops himself from unleashing it on the wall and the well-meaning waiter. Forget about that. Just make sure that doesn't happen again. Needless to say, the skunk is relieved to hear this. I, I, I understand, sir. We, we will fix the problem right away. No one else will trouble your meal moving forward. Right as he says so, you notice a pair of bulkier weasels approaching the table, wearing similar garments to the waiter's. Though they wear sunglasses, or what appears to be sunglasses, their harsh frowns and cracked fists make their intentions unmistakable. The skunk suddenly turns to face Bradbury. Speaking of, sir, you, I must kindly ask you to leave. The St. Bernard hardly reacts to the waiter's request and even pretends to take a sip from his empty glass to really drive the point home that he isn't moving. With a heavy sigh, the skunk motions for the guards, and they calmly resume their walk towards the canine, only to abruptly stop at the drake's command. No! 
He can stay. You're bewildered by what, he, by what you just heard. So is the skunk and the two weasels, for that matter. Only Bradbury appears to smile at the Drake's orders, almost knowingly so. Are, are you sure, sir? Always. He can join our table, but he'll pay for his share of the meal on his own. The dog laughs at this notion. My, how rude, and here I thought you were a gentleman. Jasper's frowning intensifies ever so slightly at Bradbury's joke, but is otherwise unconcerned. He doesn't even flinch as the St. Bernard stands up and walks over to your table, bringing his chair with him. While the two security guards hardly react as they return to their post on the other side of the locale, the skunk appears more unsettled than ever. As you wish, sir. Though I must warn you, the kitchen's only cooking a full-course meal for two people now. It'll take a while for us to catch up to. It's all right. Now it's your turn to suddenly speak up, not wanting this conversation to drag on any longer. He can have half of he can ha he can he can have my half of the meal. I'm not hungry anymore anyway. Not after everything you've heard, and especially not after seeing Bradbury here of all places. He can have your leftovers if he wishes. He can even choke on them for all you care. See, this is more like what I had in mind. You can learn quite a lot from your synthetic friend, Mr. Morgan. So I hear, Bradbury. So I hear. After some more time spent bantering and casting suspicious looks on one another, the waiters return to your table with two bowls of what looks like soup and assorted vegetables. You try to listen to the name of the dish more for once, but you honestly can't pick up a word what the skunk is saying. Half the sounds the waiters use seem like they've been made up on the spot. Nonetheless, after yet more needless dish pre presentations, the men return from whence they came, leaving the three of you alone once again. While the two men respectfully dig into their meals, you quietly turn to face the drake sitting opposite you. Okay, but for real, are you sure this is alright? With Bradbury, I mean. Jasper raises an eyebrow at your quarry. You mean with him let with letting him stay? You silently nod to him. You'd be lying if you said the St. Bernard's presence at the table wasn't making you at least somewhat uncomfortable just by itself. As fun as it would have been to see it happen, you just don't throw out the head of the FBI, android. The repercussions simply aren't worth it. The, the, the what now? You have to do a double take upon hearing Jasper's title for the canine at your side. He suddenly turns towards the dog, a mixture of surprise, anger, and fear in your eyes. You didn't tell me you were the head of the FBI yesterday. And then immediately shift your gaze onto the drake once more. And you didn't tell me that either. And neither did Mary, to be fair, but that's a discussion for another day, it would seem. Jasper reacts with nothing but nonchalance at your sudden outburst, as per usual, but the same can but the same and the same can be said for Bradbury. I thought he'd already told you. And I thought it irrelevant at the time. It had nothing to do with why I came to your place, after all. Unauthorized, I might add. The St. Bernard turns to look at you upon hearing the dragon's unfriendly remark, a confident smirk on his lips and a playful tone on his voice. Goodness, what a man, am I right? I'm surprised you managed to last this long under that gaze of his. As friendly as the dog is trying to be with you, you're smart enough to not let yourself be fooled by his poor facade. His only interest lies with you. He made that abundantly clear yesterday. Instead of giving him what he wants, you take the opportunity to redirect the conversation away from yourself as much as you can. You two don't get along very well, do you? Bradbury raises an eyebrow at your question, almost curious. Really now, does anyone get along with him? Okay, that was a little funny. The annoyed look on Jasper's face most certainly is, at least. Alright, alright, you made yourself clear. All jokes aside, can you really blame me? Can you really blame him? I mean, I am kind of his boss, and... You are not my boss! The Drake's answer is curt and firm. The owners are. I answer to no one else. Certainly not to you. Now, now, you know that's not true. Sure, you might answer to the owners, but Pandora answers to the government. Been that way for quite a while, actually. After all, someone needs to regularly check that you don't accidentally try to nuke the whole world again. St. Bernard's words are more than enough to unsettle you and the dragon both, a bit for clearly different reasons. It's not very hard to imagine just what he's, just what he's referencing, after all. So yes, Mr. Morgan, in a way you do answer to me, even if I try not to let it weigh on you too much. The Drake remains silent but defiant. He's clearly not in the mood to reply to Bradbury's taunts. Seeing as though he can't, he can't elicit a reaction from him, the FBI agent turns to face you instead. I don't think he appreciates it. Do you, Isaac? Alright, this is starting to get a little annoying, you reckon. Why are you talking to me like that? Stop it! I'm not your friend, even if you'd like me to be. He expected Bradbury to react harshly to your comments, and yet it doesn't look like he minds your passive aggressiveness all that much for whatever reason. Fair enough. I was just trying to act friendly, that's all. 
Somebody here needs to balance out all that doom and gloom of Jasper's with some positivity, after all. And from the looks of it, it's not going to be you. That's... well, he's certainly nailed that last part, all right. After everything you've learned just now with Jasper, you're in no mood for smiles or jokes. But you can't afford to indulge in these feelings right now. That's exactly what the St. Bernard wants you to do, if you had to guess. You need to divert his attention away from you as much as you can, and hope that'll prevent him from finding out anything that he can use against you. Well, why don't you invite your synthetic friend over to lighten the mood, then? I'm sure we'd all enjoy the extra pair of eyes on us at all times. You said you were in no mood for jokes, yet Bradbury pretends to laugh at your comments nonetheless. Ah, you're referring to Harlan. He's currently preoccupied with some ordinary maintenance back at our headquarters. Synthetic bodies are quite a fair bit more durable than organic ones, but they still need a little spa treatment every once in a while. You didn't say agent. This, you, your sudden interruption has Bradbury raised an eyebrow once again, evidently annoyed. Pardon me? You didn't say Agent Harlan, just Harlan. You didn't use Agent yesterday either, now that I think about it. You'd be lying if you said you didn't feel at least a little proud of yourself for spotting this little detail, even if you're not sure how much it even matters. Nonetheless, Bradbury clearly hesitated to call Harlan an FBI agent for, some re for a reason, and you might as well dig deeper into that now that you have the chance. Alright guys, I'm gonna pause it right here. Ooh, this is getting spicy. Isaac, have you found a little detail you could possibly dig out of Harlan? I'm Harlan. <laughs> Bradbury? Interesting. Yeah, uh, my guess is that Bradbury and Harlan are probably family, if I had to guess. I mean, yeah. So, or maybe a close friend, or yeah. Some, something... The, 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 there's more to them than meets the eye. And Bradbury, I know he's pot. I know he, he, I know that Sedge and such are probably writing him to be like the villain. But I mean, I can, I can understand things from his perspective. After all, Pandora almost did destroy the planet. So, you know, uh, being cautious of their intentions seems like a very, very good idea. And I don't think Bradbury is like a villain. You know. From all, from all he knows, Isaac is actually just an android that's program or android or an AI that's just programmed to act as human as possible. Now, you know, from his perspective, there's no telling what Pandora could be planning with models like Isaac. You know, <laughs> they could stick a taser in his tail. Could they stick a, a gun, a laser, a damn rocket launcher that fold, folds out from his shoulders? And this future. Anything's possible. But anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell. Leave a super thanks if you can. It always helps. Until the next video, I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye!